which is why we're sort of piggybacking off of independent events. If we know the events are independent, then the and turning into multiplication will work. So that's kind of what I recall at the top here. And, and when I first told you this, you didn't really know what independence was. Now that we know how to assess for independence, this is actually another way of assessing for independence that isn't able to be used as often, at least the way that the Regents presents the questions. This isn't used as often. Um, but if we do know that two events are independent, then the probability of A and B happening should be equal to the probability of A happening times the probability of B happening. So the first exercise jumps right into just a basic spinner. And it's being spun twice. So there's two events. And we're recording the results. Are the outcomes of the two spins dependent or independent? Now, this is just logically. There's no calculation to be done here. Does what you spin on the first spin have any bearing or effect on what's about to happen on the second spin? No. Everything is reset to its original condition. You just spin the spinner a second time, so they are totally independent for that logical reason. So knowing that they're now independent events, now we can use multiplication to calculate when we see the word and. So what is the probability that you will get an even? Probability of an even and a number greater than five on the second. So we'll do it two separate probabilities. Probability of getting an even times the probability of getting something greater than five. So out of our eight results, four out of the eight are even. And out of our eight results, how many are greater than five? Three. So three out of eight. So you multiply those, and we get 12 out of 64, which reduces, and I'll make it a decimal, 0.1875. What is the probability that you will spin a prime number and, the keyword and, a perfect square? Now this one says in either order. So when we do it this way, that is saying specifically in that order on part B. Getting an even first and then getting a result greater than five. This one is saying, what is the probability of getting a prime and a perfect square, or getting a perfect square first, and then a prime. So this is going to be a little bit more complicated because we have to do either order. And when you see the word or in probability, what operation is that? Addition. So if you're, if you're kind of switching up the way in which the order can happen, you're giving yourself a little bit of a better chance. So your probability should increase a little bit, hence the adding together. So the probability of prime, how many numbers are prime on that wheel? Right, two, three, five, and seven are the prime numbers. So four out of eight are prime. And means multiplication because these are already independent events. How many are perfect squares? One is a perfect square. Four is a perfect square, so that's two out of eight of them. Or means addition. We can flip that order. The probability of a perfect square is two eighths times the probability of a prime is four eighths. That's going to be 8 over 64 plus 8 over 64, which is going to be 16 over 64, which is 0.25. See, you have to have shortcuts like this because I can't list out all of the different possibilities. Meaning, my first spin, if I did a tree diagram, think about what a tree diagram would look like. Your first spin would be a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, or an 8. And then your second spin, each of those would have 
eight branches. So do you see where the 64 is coming from? Okay, there's eight outcomes on the first event and then each of those eight has eight more. So you have eight times eight, which is the 64 total outcomes. And then you'd have to go through and count out of those 64 outcomes, how many are a prime and a perfect square. Okay, so one, one, two would be one, one, three would be one, one being our perfect square, two being our prime. Perfect square and a prime, perfect square and a prime, perfect square and a prime with a seven. So you'd have a bunch under there, and then you'd have to go through each and every one, which would just be a long process. Um, so we use these and and or shortcuts to help us get there. And that even is small compared to how big and ugly these can get. Exercise three looks like it has three events. A class consists of 12 girls and eight boys. So I don't know about you, but I like to kind of pull out the significant information from the paragraph. A group of three is picked to give a speech. If the students are picked at random, what is the probability that they will all be boys? Use the events below to show how you calculated your final answer. So event one is the event that the first picked was a boy. Event two is the event that the second picked was a boy. Event three is that the third picked was a boy. I think we need to read into this and, and talk about first. Can the same boy do all three? Can the same boy be, be picked all three times, just based on the context of what's happening here? No, correct. I see a lot of you shaking your heads. No, that's correct. The, we're not going to hear the same boy give three different speeches or the same speech three times. So we have to assume that these events are not independent because whoever gets picked the first time, right, cannot also get picked the second time. So when you go to pick the second boy, there's only seven boys left. And now there's not 20 kids, there's only 19. So we're gonna handle this lack of independence a little bit differently. Still three events. On the first event, you definitely have an eight out of 20 chance of picking a boy, right? Now my second event is going to be an entirely different probability of picking a boy. Yes? Because now there's only how many boys left? Seven out of 19 kids. And then on my third draw, I only have six boys left out of 18 kids. So these events are not independent, but we are addressing that by the fact that we keep lessening the denominator by one and lessening the number of boys by one. Isaiah. Uh, on the Regency, you definitely would get it wrong because it's likely to be a multiple choice question and there would just, there would just be right or wrong. So you, with with probability, it's kind of, I mean, un unfortunate, but it's also a reality that you do have to think about the context of it a little bit, and it might not say it explicitly, but you have to ask yourself, are these, like if I did 8 out of 20 times 8 out of 20 times 8 out of 20, assuming that I could put the boy back in every time, you'd have to, they probably say, like logically, that can't happen based on the fact that they're giving three speeches. You need three different boys. Right, right. Because based on the context, I mean, why would the same person get the same speech three times? Again, as teachers, we would probably have like be annoyed by that in a, a little bit, but the state kind of does that you know, the way they want. It doesn't mean that we agree with it necessarily. Um, so because we address that independence issue by dropping the denominator every time, we can just, again, multiply these together. We've handled that 
and we've kind of made them independent, we've already taken that first boy out. So on the second draw, we've kind of cleared that whole situation by changing the total number of people to 19 and dropping the number of boys down to seven. So eight times seven times six gives us 336. 20 times 19 times 18 gives us 6840. And then I'm just gonna make this one a decimal 0 0.049. So just under a 5% chance that you would pick three different boys. If we jump to four, say that a power generating facility has three primary safety switches in case of an emergency. The probability that any one of these switches would fail is 5%. What is the probability that all three will fail given that the switches are independent of each other? So we want the probability that the first one fails and the second one fails and the third one fails. Fail and fail and fail. They're independent, so we can multiply. Probability of failing is 0 0.05, times failing again is 0 0.05, times the probability of the third one failing is 0 0.05. So if I multiply those, I get, my calculator says this. What does that mean again? Scientific notation, so that's like times 10 to the negative fourth power. So I have to move that decimal place over four spots. One, two, three, four, and fill with zeros. So that'll be point zero, 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 one, two, five. Which is a very small chance. It's technically a point zero, one, two, five percent chance. So less than a one, per, a, lot, a lot less than a one percent chance. So could it happen? Yes, but you'd have to be pretty unlucky for all three of those switches to fail. 5% alone is unlikely enough. So then when you kind of put three safety switches, then it makes it even less and less and less. And what do we have here on the back? The company was determining the effectiveness of its warranty sales on computers. They took data on the number of customers who purchased warranties on two different brands of computers. If a customer was chosen at random, what is the probability that they did not purchase a warranty? So, this is computer type one. If you bought computer type one, 68% of them purchased a warranty. Oh, wait, let's see how this is a tricky little table. Percentage of customers purchasing. Oh, no. Okay. These add up to 100%. Yes? So that's all of the people who are purchasing a computer. 68% of them are getting the first type, 32% of them are getting the second type. Read this carefully. The percent of those who purchased that computer who also purchased a warranty. So of these people, 35% of these people got a warranty. And if they purchased the second computer, 56% of these people got a warranty. So I want you to take a minute and try to figure out the answer to the question. If a customer was chosen at random, what is the probability that they did not purchase a warranty? And take a minute and I will have bonus points for anybody who can get this right. So think, think, think. We have time to use here. And I think there's a couple different ways you can do it, which is what I want to determine here.
raise your hand if you have an answer you'd like to throw in the mix. Andrew, how much? 9%? Nathan? Bo? Wait a minute. Whoa, those hands weren't up originally, or do you have different ones? Kaylee? Nathan? <laughs> yeah, you two are right. I'll give it both to you because you got it, and so clearly you got it because you were even more exact. Exact. Um, how did you do it, Nate? Oh boy. So that's that's kind of what I did. So. If 35% got the warranty, what he's saying is that 65% then did not. And same thing here. If 56% got the warranty, then 44% of these people did not. Okay, go on. So he's kind of using the fact that in math, of means multiply. 65% of this 68% of in math means multiply, so that gave him the new per, the percentage of type ones, and then, right, he did 44% of this 32% to figure out what percentage of that did not get the warranty. Correct. Yep. Nathan, uh, oh, look, both Nathan. Nathan, what did you do? Anything differently or exactly the same? But you did that, you multiplied the percentages together. Okay, now, and, and obviously they have good math sense to just say, well, how do they just know to do that? What I did to kind of help wrap my head around it more concretely is I made, since this is all percentages, I just made up a number of people. So if there's 100 people, 68% of them bought type one. So that's 68 people bought type one, and 32 of them bought type two. And then it's saying that of those 68 people, 65% did not buy a warranty. So I figured out what 65% of 68 people was, and that was the 44.2 of those did not, and then 44% of the 32 people did not, and that gave me 14.0. And obviously being people, a decimal doesn't really make sense, but that gives us 58.28 people who did not buy the warranty, and since I did it out of 100, that's easy to convert to a percentage, okay? So that was definitely a, a tricky one. Um, the last section here is, is how many ways can something happen? So if you play four baseball games, in how many ways can you win two? So you could win the first two. You could win the first and the third, and you could win the first and the fourth. Or you could win the second and the third, and the second and the fourth. Or you could win the third and the fourth. So you could really, you could list it all out, um, but that takes more, more time. And then in math, there's, or in probability anywhere, have you, has anybody ever heard of a permutation or a combination? This is kind of tricky. Permutations and combinations, and your calculator is going to do this for you, um, are going to tell you how many ways some, some event can happen without actually having to go through and count it. So in permutations, we're going to talk more about this in a second, just put order matters, and in a combination, order does not matter. When order matters, you have to kind of count it separately. In this particular baseball game question, is winning the first game and the second game different than, than if I had said that they won the second game and they won the first game? Or is that the same thing? That's the same thing. So order doesn't matter here. Winning the first and the second game is the same 
situation is winning the second and the first. So order does not matter, so that would be a combination. And there's four games total, and we do a combination where we're picking winning two of them. And under your math button on your calculator, you have a probability section. And you have NPR and NCR. The P stands for permutation, the C stands for combination. So if you hit the NCR button, you're gonna see that we actually needed to put the N number in first. So if I clear my screen, there are four baseball games and I'm looking at how many combinations. So then I would go to my math, over to probability, down to NCR, and I'm trying to do how many combinations with winning two of them. So that gives us the six. So there are six ways that that can happen. Now those are the same six I kind of listed out. You can win the first and the second, the first and the third, or the first and the fourth, or the second and the third, or the second and the fourth, or the third and the fourth, and that's six different answers. Um, number two says it's either gonna rain or not rain. In a span of seven days, how many ways could it rain three days? So does the order matter here? Is raining on the first day, the second day, and the third day any different than raining on the third day, the second day, and the first day? No. So that would also be 7C3, and you type that in to your calculator like that. On a 10-question multiple choice test, in how many ways can you get exactly eight right? Now, is getting the first eight right on a quiz a different result than getting the last eight right? It's the same grade, but it's a different way of doing it, right? So order does matter. If you get the first eight right, you've done differently than someone who's gotten the last eight right. So this one would be 10 P8, because your order of getting the eight right can change We'll do more with that tomorrow. I don't think any of those come up on your homework, so I'm just going to give you your